Notebook on Cities and Culture's Korea Tour is brought to you by Daniel Murphy, David Hayes, and Polar Inertia Journal, an outlet for artists and researchers documenting the urban condition at polarinertia.com. What do you think is the hardest thing about being a Korean entrepreneur? I think... The challenge for being a Korean entrepreneur is that you're the first generation to sort of come to the system. And so if you were in the 1940s and 50s in Silicon Valley, you face many of the same problems. Uh, investors aren't used to sort of high-speed, high-velocity growth companies. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, expertise and sort of in-situ knowledge to uh, build companies easily. And so you are blazing your own path. You have to do everything. You have to teach everyone. You have to build whole new networks that don't exist today. And so... Nothing's, nothing was there already. That's right. Um, you know, there are, of course, a lot of large companies, and there are certainly partnership opportunities. So you're not also doing the economic development aspect of it, but you have to constantly be teaching. And that is in addition to building your own business. This is Notebook on Cities and Culture. I'm Colin Marshall here in Seoul, a land with ever more entrepreneurs getting ever slightly easier for them, specifically in Xinchon. Xinchon? Xinchon? How is it written in Hangul? Xinchon. See, I get this confused with the other one. I got lost one time because I went to the other one, which was like an hour out of my way. Xinchon. <laughs> we are in Xinchon here in Seoul, Korea. I'm speaking with Danny Crichton. He is a contributing writer at TechCrunch. He is also a researcher and a writer on regional innovation hubs. Describe to me what kind of a regional innovation hub you find here. I think um, one of the true advantages Korea has with Seoul is that it is a political, economic, cultural, and social hub for an entire country. Um, you, in you know, the United States, you have a lot of different cities with a lot of different industries, but all those industries are concentrated right here. And so you have this advantage of being able to connect a lot of different disciplines, a lot of different skill sets together in unique ways. I think one of the reasons why the, the Korean wave, specifically around K-pop and Korean dramas, was successful is because you were able to merge people from the business world, from the cultural world, uh, etc., all at once. Uh, because this is New York, Los Angeles, Washington, D.C., Silicon Valley, that's all right, here. All in one place. And that means that you always can find the right kind of people in the industries, but they may not know a lot about what you are doing. And so part of the work you have to work on in this region is building those uh, networks, because many of them right now are focused around the large companies, around the specific industries, and most people don't necessarily get outside of those specific zones. How did your attention first turn toward Korea and toward Seoul as a regional innovation hub? Yeah, so I, you know, several years ago I was interested very heavily in Asia, um, and specifically China. And because it's China or because? Because it's China. And when you read the media, when you read news, China's going to take over the world. China's growth pattern is extremely fast. Uh, and then I got into getting past sort of those news stories and trying to look at the evidence. And what I saw was you have sort of three countries here in East Asia. You have Japan, which peaked in 1990 with the, the property bubble in Tokyo, still trying to recover from that 20 years later. Um, a lot of deep problems um, that go into a lot of the companies, Sony being the crucial example in that country, uh, a, a company that was dominating almost every industry it's touched and now today is being pretty much destroyed in almost every industry used to touch. And they, used were to they, Sam, were they were once Samsung-like. They were once Samsung-like. Yeah. Absolutely. And yeah. so when you look at where Korea was, Korea jumped a lot of the industries that Japan sort of got stuck in. So, you know, Korea never really had the computing industry that Japan did, but it has the mobile industry. And today, mobile is everything. And so what I saw was a country that was essentially on the cutting edge, that had the highest mobile penetration in the world, that has the fastest broadband, that was starting to take over in many ways the cultural aspects of Asia around K-pop, K-drama. This was about seven, eight years ago. And so... From my view, I got really interested in seeing that aspect of it. Um, and I actually, having spent quite a bit of time here, I really think Korea has the most opportunity of the three going forward in the sense that 
It is the bridge between so many cultures. It sits between Japan and China, but also Southeast Asia, also Singapore. It's very central. That's right. It's very central. And culturally, there's just less baggage across the entire industry. Historically, they, they throw the baggage away here. They throw the baggage away here very quickly. So to the good and to the bad. To the sometimes. good and the bad. And I, I think that that sort of grasping for the future is what will keep Korea at the cutting edge. And that is one of its strongest skills. Not having a billion poor people. That's I mean, to draw a line with China. Absolutely. And, you know, China has... As China's government always argues, it is a developing country, and you can't just look at it as Beijing and, and Shanghai and the Pudong, and I completely agree with that. I think uh, China has a very long road to go. It has a lot of challenges ahead of it, and Korea is one of the few countries in the world that has gone from a developing to a developed country. It used to be $63 per capita in 1963, and to today it's in the mid-20s, and uh, has the potential to double, and that's really exciting. It made a vast amount of wealth between the yeah, mid-1960s and mid-1990s. That's right. Uh, you can go ahead. I'll, I'll, this will okay. be a longer question. Uh, it's important to get coffee imbibed before <laughs> answering. <laughs> It's a conversation that wasn't really being had maybe in the past 10 years among Koreans, but now it is in the wake of, of course, the ferry sinking and, and looking back at the various tragedies that preceded that over 10 years before, 20 years before, 30 before. Koreans now ask themselves, is this really a developed country? What do you say to that? I think, and in fact, I'm actually writing about this tonight, um, so mid draft on this topic, but I think... You can just read that out loud. Pull it up on your <laughs> I think the... Korea has moved at breakneck speed for a very long time. No country really in the history of the world has gone from practically nothing to a modern metropolis and a cosmopolitan society in 40 years. And we haven't even switched generations. And the people who were alive 40 years ago, many of them are still here. Um, certainly getting old, but they're still here. Um, and the culture doesn't move as fast, I think, as Koreans today would really want. Uh, to yesterday, the second prime minister candidate for the Park administration um, withdrew his nomination over some uh, comments he had made in the past. And, you know, the bar has really gone high. People don't like the corruption. People don't like... Um, the cheating. Um, one of the ministers copied his dissertation when he was writing his PhD. And one of the arguments I make is 20 years ago, everyone did this. Um, that was a cultural of catching up. This is how you get from nothing to something. You can't really follow the rules and really do this. And you can, be, you can do what Korea has done by following the rules. That's right. And um, I mean, one of my um, uh, economist I like to read is uh, Hajun Jang, who's a, a Korean economist and a heterodox economist. How who, heterodox do you see him as being? Um, he really emphasizes the importance of state-led economic development, and specifically his term is uh, kicking away the ladder. And the idea is that the United States back in the early 1800s against Britain did not follow patents, it didn't follow intellectual property, it broke all the rules. But now that the U.S. has power, essentially we want these rules enforced because we benefit more than a developing country does from them. And I think that's really true. Now the problem is, is that people's expectations in Korea have gone from let's catch up to we're looking for these idealistic, perfect people. Number one. And they don't exist. And so I think there really has to be a discussion, and this is really what the Post is really talking about, but you have to have a discussion about, look, there is no one who's over the age of 30 who's even going to touch the sort of ideal form that people are looking for. So either we're not going to select anyone, or we're going to have to move forward and constantly strive to get better and allow people to sort of um, air their sins out and uh, be different people. Was there some specific thing, some type of Korean innovation that first turned your head when, as we say, you first realized this was a fascinating place with potential? Was there, was there some specific thing that, that drew your attention? There are a couple of interesting inventions that I can think about um, that I, I think show the promise here. One example of this is um, there are these virtual grocery stores in some subway stations which just have basically cardboard cutouts with the pictures of goods with QR codes that you can scan and then get groceries delivered to your home. Um, it was sort of a pilot. I, I haven't seen as many of them these days, but I thought it was a really interesting example of 
um, taking advantage of sort of the subway culture here, the fact that people are all mobile uh, focused uh, in the country, and sort of the ability to do a lot of same day deliveries here that sort of brought all this together in one sort of product. By any standard, Seoul is an exciting city. I mean, I think of the life that the life that goes on in the subway stations alone, and that's pretty exciting, especially compared to the subways in America, where they're just trains. I mean, there's nothing more than that. But it's an exciting city, and I do wonder how compatible you think exciting city is with Innovation Hub, because the example of Silicon Valley, no one really wants to live in Silicon Valley, do they, other than the fact that you can do some tech work there? I mean, why is it so boring? Well, I grew up in a very suburban culture. Uh, it grew up around Stanford. It grew up um, in what was at the time a bedroom community. Um, and the specific people in the 30s, 40s, and 50s that really were gravitated towards um, the semiconductor industry in the 60s and earlier, the integrated circuit, the Kleistron tubes, and the radar industries, was, yeah, they, were, they were engineers. They were middle class. They were hardworking. They were passionate about their products. It was a time when the world was far less global in market, in mindset, um, and people just focused on the tech. And the the oasis that was Silicon Valley was actually that you didn't have to do all these other activities, that you were able to focus on what you wanted to work on, go home, have a nice family life, and it was just an environment. Go to bed early. And go to bed early. And it's an environment lifestyle. Um, I think today... Technology has really transformed. It's not just a circuit board or uh, more uh, integrated circuits. It, it's really around apps, and it's around software that is used by end users around the world. And so if you want success today, it's not just about having the fastest performance or the most efficient use of resources. It's much more about marketing, about connecting culturally with users, about engagement. And so... That's why Silicon Valley has very quickly inched up and sort of miled up, if you will, up to uh, San Francisco. I mean, the, the base of it used to be Palo Alto, Santa Clara, um, all the way down to San Jose. Today, it's it, the balance is probably halfway between San Francisco and Palo Alto. So that's moved almost 30 miles north. And that's because in San Francisco, you are able to get that global um, cosmopolitan um, cultural aspect to it that you were not able to do before. The innovation is going to happen in an exciting city today, right? I, th I think that's absolutely true. In, in this particular industry, and we're talking about mobile apps, software, I think that that's absolutely the case. Now, what's interesting is if you look at industries like virtual reality. Um, I remember those words from middle school. <laughs> <laughs> well, so we have the, the first multi-billion dollar X in the virtual reality space just this year um, with the uh, acquisition of Oculus, which was in L.A., uh, outside Irvine. Um, and we have SpaceX, and we have a variety of companies also in L.A. in that those particular industries. And so what's interesting is in, in that particular area, you have a lot of defense and technology and biotech. And so I, th I think the trick to all these innovation regions is really understanding, you know, what do you need to know to do well? If you're in oil innovation and extraction, you know, Houston... Abu Dhabi are probably the areas you should work in because those are the people. That's what's interesting. Of exciting cities. Well, <laughs> Houston's pretty big. It's got. I, I won't. I won't uh, condemn Houston. Abu Dhabi's probably not that exciting. <laughs> I've never been there, so I wouldn't know. Uh, I have yet to record a series of interviews in Abu Dhabi, but if it happens, I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you how that goes. <laughs> you mentioned apps, and this is an app-loving culture, South Korea, and any. Anyone who comes to Korea or who makes a lot of Korean friends or who studies the language inevitably discovers one app in particular, KakaoTalk, mm -hmm. which is Korea's own, essentially, texting and VOIP call app. Mm -hmm. Why does Korea have its own one of those? What's the significance of KakaoTalk? You know, it's actually a really interesting history. So Kakao was actually one of the earliest companies in this particular space. So this space being, I call it Messaging 2.0, um, which is sort of this always-on app-based uh, messaging app. Um, there's a couple of reasons why it took off here. Um, one was messaging was always expensive here. Uh, and so you had free messaging because most people have unlimited Wi-Fi and this sort of thing. So the ability to make VoIP calls is very important. Uh, most plans actually have a very limited number of minutes. Um, so, for instance, uh, you can get an unlimited data plan with 300 minutes for $55 or 55,000 won. 
Um, and if you want more minutes, it's, it's, it's actually extraordinarily expensive. So VoIP calls is extremely a valuable resource. As a contrast to America, where we get these plans with an enormous number of minutes and none of us ever make that's phone right. calls. That's right. And that's because the infrastructure has moved forward. And so the companies have upgraded that infrastructure for data-heavy sort of bandwidth. And some of the original 2G and 3G networks are already being pulled out. Um, whereas in the U.S., we built it out, and we have such a large country that building out that network took a really long time. And now you don't want to replace that whole in infrastructure with the next wave of, of, of yes. generation of... This country's uh, the size of Indiana, so right. that's, you know, <laughs> picture doing this 50 times. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And, I mean, Wi-Fi is everywhere for that reason. And so every coffee... I mean, I'm sure we're on Wi-Fi right now. Um, and so for the Kaka Talk, I think was A, one of the first in the messaging space, and B, it was actually the first to really monetize messaging. And so between stickers and a lot of these add-ons and... Uh, I've never bought one of those. Have you bought the stickers? I've never bought a sticker package. <laughs> that may be a Korean-only thing. And they're crazy popular, and it's because uh, Koreans, uh, I think, really like to express themselves well through chat applications. And so, um, I mean, some of my friends only talk in stickers. <laughs> uh, you know, are you hungry? Uh, are you, do you want to get food? There are stickers for these. Why have we wasted our time learning Korean when we could have just <laughs> talked that way? Spent 20 bucks on stickers and just uh, communicated totally that way. Culturally ambiguous stickers, so anyone can use them. And yes. so um, what was interesting, though, but Koka was also, um, you know, a, a perfect story of the challenges that Korean entrepreneurs face, which is it won the market here. It's 99% ownership of the market of Korea, but when it tried to expand overseas, its ability to translate its product to other markets was much harder. Um, and so companies like WhatsApp did extremely well in Europe. Um, companies like Line did extremely well in Japan, now doing well in Southeast Asia. WeChat did really well in China. And so it was never able to really find a niche outside of Korea. And so consistently we see this where Korea is a big enough market that you can actually win a major product. In the case of Kako Talk, it sold Merge for $3.2 billion just a few weeks ago. Um, but it never really found success outside the outside of its home market, even though it was first. There's a fair few Korea-only things like that, aren't there, especially in the tech sphere. There's certain phenomena you, phenomena you can point to where it's like... Only Korea is playing StarCraft in stadiums, you know, for example. There's, why is there so much only in Korea is this tech thing going on type? Uh, why can you say that about so many things? I think um, on the one hand, it's a very insular culture, and this goes back thousands of years. Uh, historians will point out to uh, the sort of increase of xenophobia over uh, from years of being stuck between Japan and China. Um, but I also think frankly, that uh, there are just different infrastructure here that allows this to happen. So, for instance, when it comes to StarCraft, you have these rooms filled with computers that you can practice on for days at a time at a dollar an hour uh, using modern hardware. You um, have a group of people who are actually interested in watching this. I mean, actually, what's interesting is I've, I've always said that Korea is just ahead of the market. It's not necessarily unique. It's just ahead. So when you look at, say, StarCraft, yes, the sort of modern uh, video game competitive industry is here. But today, Twitch, a startup which allows for recording of video games, um, is potentially being sold for a multi-billion dollar price to Google, um, which has been rumored for a while now. And so that's... That's just a sign that now in the U.S. we're having a ton of people watch this. It's actually a lot of live entertainment. There's actually millions of people watching it in the U.S. Now, why is it always first here? I think that's because the infrastructure moves so much faster. When you want to build a new store, you'll see a restaurant be torn down, a new restaurant put in place in two or three weeks. And it's going. In my neighborhood here, there was an elevated highway that divided it in half. And the elevated highway was gone in eight weeks. Mm. Uh, about a mile long stretch of elevated highway totally disappeared in about eight, eight weeks. You could use that in the States. <laughs> <laughs> in eight weeks, you would be still be discussing, like, yeah. you know, who even should be working on the project. Would it be a two or three year? Eight like, years wouldn't be enough. <laughs> and we're just talking removal, not even construction. And so I think that's one of the absolute strongest parts here is just the, the speed at which society moves. I mean, it's a whole new city every two years. And so um, Korea just tends to get stuff early, and then the rest of the world catches up. There's one new city that's been built or is still being built that I'll be visiting soon and that you've written about. I've, I've read your posts on it. It's uh, Songdo. Yes. What's going on there? What is that? 
So Songdo um, is a, a small sort of city near Incheon, um, so near the Inter Incheon International Airport that was sort of designated as you're called an entrepreneurship hub or a global business hub of Korea. The idea being that since Korea is in the middle of so many large economies that by moving it next to Incheon, uh, it was able to create a space where international businesses could expand easily. Um, and the government did a lot to encourage this, so it built the city. Um, I believe it's targeted at a quarter million people living there and a concomitant number of businesses. And uh, the government also incentivized around visas and a lot of paperwork that for companies that move there, they get tax incentives, visa incentives, uh, et cetera, investment incentives. I think the, the challenge it has faced over the last few years, and I think even the governor of Songdo has admitted this publicly, is people want to be where the other people are, um, that the world runs on networks. Um, one of the authors I think really puts this well is uh, Edward Glazer, who wrote Triumph of the City, a book I'm sure you've read. But um, you know, he opens with a really interesting question, which is, as the cost of communications has decreased, um, people want to live near other people more and more. Rents have actually increased dramatically in cities in the last 15 years for a variety of reasons, but one of which is just demand. And um, that fact gets presented as counterintuitive, but I don't know if it really is because I, it doesn't. It didn't. It wouldn't occur to me because I have the internet to go live in the middle of nowhere. Like it's just. It's not. It's in an absolute sense not appealing to live in the middle of nowhere. That's right. That's not like we've all been yearning to do that, right? That's right. And I think you know the, what would face Songdo was the fact that it was literally in the middle of nowhere, and so it. I mean, even getting to Seoul takes two hours by the subway. Um, yeah, there's no high the map, speed. and it's like it's you take this train, then this train, then like a dedicated train just for that. It's 43 stops oh um, all the way out there. And so this was a mistake. Um, I think the ones closer here, are so Digital Media City or Digital Media City um, or Guru Digital Media Complex have done better in terms of they're on main lines in Seoul. They're sort of in the middle of business, etc. But you know, it's interesting that the, the startups here are concentrated around the financial industry in, in Korea. They're where the people are who can fund them. And so, unsurprisingly, and I, I think that when I look at regional innovation hubs, my answer is never dictate to people where they should live, work, or eat. It should always be about incentivizing, getting people to go where they already want to go and making it easier, or making it simpler. Um, perhaps encouraging it through investment, etc. And I think in the last two years, Korea has really moved m much better about those sorts of issues. This sort of command of just, we're going to build an economic innovation hub here, we're going to put the buildings down, this is the number of people we want here and the number of businesses. I mean, that sounds like, is it just an echo of the good slash bad old days, depending on what side of the fence you're on, when uh, Park Chung-hee could say, start building ships. Okay, great, now be number one. Now start building, I don't know, I forget what else he said, ships was one of the main things, but he did literally just say, be great at these industries, and somehow it worked. Is this just an echo of that sort of thinking? I think it is. Um, I think it's, it's, again, everything here has moved so fast, but the culture hasn't necessarily changed as quickly. Um, I, I think that one of the other aspects that's worked better is that the government actually is dynamic here, that it does not generally get stuck on projects for too long. When things don't work, it generally pulls the plug. People tend to not want to take responsibility, and so then people sort of just all disappear and go on to new projects. And so while there is waste at times, there's also experimentation, and that comes with the territory. It has to happen. I think. I think when it comes to issues like innovation, it's really hard to just build innovation. Um, it's a complicated thing. It's, it's intellectual. It's in our people's minds. It's not a train system. I mean, the government here is extremely effective at building infrastructure. It has the fastest broadband, which is a particularly focused on government investment. It has one of the best subway stations. It's by far the most extensive subway system in the world in Seoul. And the bus network is extremely good as well. And so then you get to innovation, you're suddenly, well, how do, how, how do you, how do you if, make that efficient? How do you make it move quickly? And so suddenly you go from this optimization framework, which is person A to person B, how do I get there as quickly as possible to, well, what, what do we do? And so it is a little bit of that, if you build it, they will come mentality. Um, and 
I think the government has really learned. I mean, Songdo is a multi-year project that I think is coming towards its end. And in the last two years, the government's really moved towards investment, um, investment multiples. So, if uh, a venture capital uh, leverage, basically, that the government backs, and so that tends to work a lot better. And that's a much more of, um, you know, let the market sort of dictate it, and then just help it, you know, make it easier, make it simpler, make it cheaper, um, rather than just build it. But yes, I think that culture has been continuous. Isn't there like a giant Hello Kitty park out there too in your Songdo? Yes, I've been to the Hello Kitty park. There's also a really large recreation of the Bible. There's a whole park. There's a Noah's Ark, and I'm I'm not even kidding. There's a full size Noah's Ark um, that you can walk through. You can see all these. It's in the middle of nowhere. In the middle of nowhere, so it's it's, it's yeah. quite interesting because you just walk upon it, and suddenly there's like Jesus and the manger at like life-sized duplication. I have no idea where it came from or why it was there. Uh, this is like what you see on a road trip going through America. Like I went through this state <laughs> that I had barely heard of off this highway that I'd never driven before, and there was a giant Bible. Okay, but in <laughs> South Korea, like where do you put a giant? You put it in Songdo, I guess. That's right. But what is what are the other? There's a bunch of purpose-built cities around Seoul, aren't there? There's, it's not just Songdo. There's a few, a fair few. What do they, what do they build them for? What are they, what are these places? Yes, yeah, so and then towards the north is Paju, which has become a. It was always a fairly heavy in the publishing industry, but now is a designated book publishing city. So the government provides incentives, tax incentives for other companies to move to that area. Um, in near Daejeon, there's a city called Sejong City, which is supposed to become sort of a. Government and biomedical hub of Korea, in Busan, which is the second largest city in Korea, it's now a film and culture designated city. I think um, there, it's, it's certainly religiously held that uh, agglomeration theory and the idea that industry should work together and work best when they are near each other um, is definitely taken very seriously here, um, perhaps to an extreme. Um, what's interesting is agglomeration tends to happen organically right. if it is valuable, um, and so uh, there are a lot of these cities. Um, I don't know how effective they are. I think they're mostly effective when there were already industries in place that did well. So it's 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 telling about Korea. I mean, there's the, that behavior of setting down these purpose-built cities. This is where the film industry is going to be. This is where there's going to be. Tech innovation. This is where there's publishing. That's not the behavior of what we think of as a capitalist country normally. Yet, South Korea is also on a, just a street level, one of the most capitalist places I've ever seen. So what's going on here? It seems like a place that is somehow capitalistic, and dare I say it, because they, you know, with the North up there, they don't, they don't like you saying this word socialistic as well. Kind of a place. What's going on? I think there's a really specific and unique hybrid model. Um, in which the government takes a much larger role in the economy than I think Americans are comfortable with. One of the benefits of that is that you're able to develop much quicker than you might otherwise be able to do so. Um, I don't necessarily think that the United States would benefit from that direction, mostly because we're at a very different stage of development. Um, and even here, I think when you see some of the waste around some of these cities and some of these projects, um, you're starting to see the end of how far government can really take you. I mean, it's not really an organizational problem anymore. It's not really an infrastructure problem anymore. It's much more creative. It's much more bottoms up than top down. And I think if there's one lesson really from the Korean experience is that top down really worked. Um, this was an incredibly top down economy in the 60s and 70s, as you mentioned before with Park Chung Hee, um, starting with heavy and chemical industries, shipbuilding, uh, construction and into the 80s and 90s into information technology and the IT industries. Um, all that was really pushed and heavily ordered by the Korean government here. Today it's much harder to do that because Korea is on the frontier. It has to be creative. It has to build new things and the government can't really incentivize and just say, well, look, this is the next new thing, robots, and suddenly we're going to have robots. So you can just, you know, it's easy to say having chemical industries. We know what the formula is. We just need to catch up. Now you've caught up, and I think the answer has to be a little more um, 
push from entrepreneurs from below rather than sort of government administrators from above? We haven't in America thought, we, we haven't been able to seriously believe that a government knows what the next big thing is or knows much of anything, to be honest. I mean, the trust <laughs> is sort of gone in America there, right? I think um, it, there's a really large widely held belief, which I think is somewhat mythical, that the government can't pick winners. Um, I think if there is proof from a lot of other areas around the world that the government can pick winners, that sometimes picking a company makes it a winner, um, and getting people to focus on one winner actually allows you to compete at a higher level than if the government sort of allowed 20 competitors to kill each other. Um, this was the history of Japan for many years and also the history here. Um, Samsung would not be the company it is today if it had to compete in its home market for 30 years to try to win the television industry. It instead it got incredible incentives to go overseas, to export, to be the number one television producer around the world. Um, I don't know if the U.S., you know, today that, that is such a, it's anathema to say that the government should really be choosing companies or choosing industries. The challenge is, is that when you have a com country as large as China, which is a government that actively chooses companies, it actively incentivizes them, you know, it's not an even playing field, and that's not going to change anytime soon, uh, the way that the these Asian countries are sort of organized. And so the U.S. really, I think, needs to be adaptable to the market as it is rather than a hypothetical market that does not exist. Is there an advantage to being a huge country these days? I think there's always an advantage to scale. I think what's interesting is you have very different incentives depending on if you're a small, medium, or large country. So two weeks ago, I was in Singapore for a week talking to a lot of entrepreneurs uh, related to the Echelon Conference. Um, and Singapore is about 5 million people. It's a very modern, successful, one of the highest GDP per capita in the world. One-tenth the size of my population of Korea. Exactly. And so in Singapore, global is where you start. Uh, there is no home market. Um, there is nothing to build for a home market. Maybe for street food. <laughs> exactly, in hawker centers. But, you know, really outside of, you know, the first few months, you have to go overseas. You're going to Indonesia, you're going to China, you're going to Malaysia. You've got to go somewhere. Um, that's really hard. Because from the very first point, you have to build a global business. And that doesn't allow you to test, doesn't allow you to look for product market fit. Um, I think it's actually much more tough than um, some of the Singaporeans let on. Korea and other countries in sort of the medium space, I think, are sort of that beautiful point where they have a market large enough that you can spend two, three years just perfecting the product, and then you can go overseas. But it's not so large that you can sort of wait forever, and that's okay. Um, that seems you know, to be Japan's problem. They're just large enough that they don't have to care. Absolutely. In Japan, you can build something for the Japanese market and never go overseas, and that's okay. And you can build a great company, And but there's really not that incentive. And if there is, it usually comes very late, and it's too late to really do anything. Korea always knows it's going to go global, but it doesn't have to. And that's sort of the nice place where companies can sort of always be paying attention, always be ready, but you know can adapt when it needs to do so. United States, Japan, even China now... You know, there are huge markets, and so if you're a company in the U.S., you don't have to think. You really don't have to think globally. You can build a $10, $20 billion business just in the United States. And so I know there's always concerns about people copying overseas. Rock Internet, most famously, which takes business models from Silicon Valley and just gets them working in Europe and in Asia. But in all honesty, I mean, you can build huge companies just in the U.S. You don't have to think about it. And so you actually have to make a strategic decision very early. Are you U.S. only? Are you going to be U.S. and then global someday? Are you going to go global early on? And that, that can be confusing for a lot of entrepreneurs, and it requires a lot more strategic insight. Um, where, where in America are you actually from? I don't think I've actually I've read where. Um, so I, was, I grew up in Minnesota, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and then... Uh, I spent about five and a half, six years in the Bay Area. Getting exposed to Silicon Valley culture? That's right. Now, what was the, what was the first, I mean, was that where innovation, entrepreneurialism, and so on and so forth began to intrigue you? Absolutely. I mean, I think I started my first business in high school, so I've, I've always been entrepreneurial myself, but I never really thought of it as a, an area to study, as a, as a human behavior to study. Um, as, a, as an undergrad at Stanford and sort of in the heart of Silicon Valley, um, you know, I was surrounded by it all the time. And what I was really interested in is seeing 
the connections between universities, industry, and sort of government, how that interacted, um, specifically around research. I always study things I'm in, like, working on. So when I was in the universities, I focused on higher education. When I'm here, I'm focused on career entrepreneurship. So it's sort of a... Feedback loop going. That's right, exactly. And I think... Um, you know, it became a really fascinating story. So um, I've always been interested in, in, in public policy. That is where a lot of my research is in and writing. I've always been interested on technology. I've been programming since I was six. And so when you look at these regional innovation hubs, it really is a cross-section of these different areas. It's a cross-section of the science and technical disciplines with policy and economics. And so it basically touches on everything I love, love researching. Now, that interaction of innovation, of universities, of government, how does it, what's, what's the difference that jumps out at you between how that trio works in the States and how it works in South Korea? The United States benefits from real strength on the university side. And this is true not just against Korea, but really against the entire world. The American higher education system is so strong compared to the rest of the world. It's, it still looks good to you. It's still, I mean, even even over the last five or six years of budget cuts at state universities with endowment cuts because of investment losses, it is absolutely so far ahead of the rest of the world. I mean, I think if you, the next two countries would be the UK and Japan, um, and they are very much distant second of you know, in second and third countries. Uh, it's really incredible. I mean, when you look at any ranking, at the top 100, it'll be almost 70 or 80 universities in the United States. And so the U.S. really benefits from having the best facilities for research. Um, and so when we, look, when we talk about university, sort of industry, government partnerships, I mean, the U.S. just benefits from that one third of it is just so strong that the other two sort of just follow along with that. Um, the bulk of the 20th century in America is kind of the history of, after the war, universities and universities and other entities as well sort of ginning up innovation, yes? That's right. And I think um, there a couple of really key policy decisions in hindsight really helped us. So one was... Um, the creation of the National Science Foundation in, 19, in the early 1950s. Um, Benny Var Bush, who was the science advisor to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, um, really wanted an elitist research agency, which was purely meritocratic, focused on the best research, um, not based about patronage, not based about local politics such as distribution, um, but it's purely based on what is going to advance the science the furthest. And that research agency was so crucial to getting universities to focus on the research questions that were at the heart of academia today. Um, second was the GI Bill, which brought a lot of the middle class coming back from the war into universities and colleges. It greatly expanded their reach. Um, you know, re universities up until the 40s did not take money from the government, by and large, outside of the public universities. Private universities took no research funding, uh, did not have financial aid were mostly closed off except to a very small sliver of the population. And so universities suddenly became sort of these cauldrons of culture, diversity, ideas, intellectualism that really, there was really lacking before. And what's interesting is when you look at a, uh, much of the rest of the world and the higher education there, um, uh, France in particular I'm thinking of, but also the UK, also Japan, uh, they never went through sort of these large openings. They're still, in many cases, following the same policies they have for hundreds of years. And, you know, we, our system is very different today than it was 75 years ago. Um, and that's where I think we really benefited a lot. Are the schools here in Seoul not cauldrons? Um, it's certainly in terms of racial or cultural diversity, well, in South of Korea. Korea. Of course, most of these universities are about 99% Korean. They are trying to actively outreach more. There are attempts to get the faculties to be more uh, interesting. But I think the challenge here is is much like the rest of the economy. Um, the government controls a lot of the decision-making at public and private universities. And so here in, in Korea... Almost every university except one, which is KAIST, the Korea Advanced Institute for Science and Technology, the government determines the number of majors of every major in the department. So it just sounds weird at this it's point. It's weird. There is no market on this. So if the government sees that they 
either sees that the market needs more computer scientists or wants more computer scientists in the market. They simply increase the number of quota slots for every university across the system. And so that's just one example of where the research agendas are very much um, top-down driven rather than researcher driven um, and there's just not a lot of flexibility and innovation in that system and again I think that that's true in much of the rest of the world um, it's not just a Korea thing but you know giving universities so much independence is, is really tough for a lot of governments to kind of let that go yeah, the idea that Korea needs X, Y, and Z. Korea needs these majors. Korea needs these students. Has a bit more traction here. I mean, in America, if I was growing up and I, so it's like, America needs you to be this. What are you talking about? Amer America needs me to do something? No, you don't. I mean, here, though, it's still, that idea, that idea is a bit more current, right? I think it's, it's certainly decreased over the last 20 years. I mean, 20, 30 years ago, you, you got what you got. and you needed everything 30 years ago. You needed everything. And specifically, I think people really understood that as a, a developing country with limited resources, you, you had to sacrifice. Everyone understood that the only way all of us succeed is that everyone does their part to make the system work. I think that that sort of unity is certainly gone today. Um, and that, that's, I think, for, to a certain degree, a good thing. I mean, it means more individuals, people can choose what they want to do. Um, it's a sign of success for Korea that it really doesn't have to tell everyone what everyone has to do. It, it can actually allow people to pick different careers, to be flexible, to, to pick cultural careers or whatnot. Um, I think the challenge um, is that there's still a lot of work to be done. And so in this middle phase, and, and I was actually just had a conversation yesterday about this, and that Korea is going to be the first country that really goes from 20 to 40,000 GDP per, per capita, that, you know, what does that look like? How do you get people to still be unified around and next, another doubling? Um, it's a really tough battle because... What unity do you need when you're making 40 right. grand a year? You know, and so how do you continue to progress um, while giving people more flexibility in their options? Because the kids today don't want to... And, and shouldn't really be forced to do what what the government thinks is, is right for them. Um, you know, a lot of them, the government really incentivizes computer science production, engineer production, um, and a lot of students don't want to do this anymore, whereas in the past they would have said, yes, that's what the country needs, that's what I'm willing to do. Now, as I say, we're both American, and here we are speaking well outside of America. I was, I've often thought, especially in sort of the rock bottom of the financial crisis recently. I'd, I'd be seeing so many articles saying desperate Americans will do anything for work. Uh, Americans try this and that. Nothing works. You know, uh, Americans want jobs, but there's no way they can get them. The subtext always seemed to me, the unspoken subtext was Americans, desperate Americans will do anything but leave America. Like, they, they don't, there's something about America where there's a sense like, well, I'm already in America. Uh, but maybe people our age and younger are starting to realize you can go outside America. I mean, you're living here in Korea. I probably will be in the next couple of years myself. Do you think people our age and younger, Americans our age and younger, are realizing that uh, they too can be immigrants or expats or what have you? Sure. I think um, you know, traditionally the United States has one of the lowest rates for passport Whole, you know, people who have applied for passports of any of the industrialized countries. Um, for a while, that was because of the lack of the eurozone, and so everyone in Europe basically had to have a passport just to go down the street. But um, I, I think what's happening is, when the United States was by far the dominant economic superpower of the free world in the 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s, etc., um, you know, why would you go anywhere else? This was where the economy was. This was the center of culture. This was Hollywood. This was, there were no other centers to go. I mean, Europe was rebuilding from the war. You know, Japan and Korea were rebuilding from the war. China was non-existent as an economy. It was completely closed off from the outside world. When you're the only non-impoverished country, I guess, I mean, yeah, I'll stay here. It just, it just, uh, power by relative. Um, and what's happening today is, although the United States' absolute power continues to increase, its relative power is absolutely decreasing. There are many places to work. There are many top companies. The companies are more scattered than they used to be. Um, if you looked at the global 500 of top companies, it's a much more diverse group. There's many more international, non-U.S. companies in that list than there were years ago. So I think for the people today, um, one, we grew up in a much more global time in which we had access to the Internet. And so I think I, I, we're more... In, much as we say they're digital natives, I think we're also more global natives. We're able to move 
um, from culture to culture. And I think um, as opportunities are spread up, I think we will see people who want to go and spend more time overseas because those opportunities exist. And um, I don't know, I don't think of it as necessarily a, a negative story. I think it's actually quite a positive story that actually the rest of the world has developed, is reaching similar levels of parity, and it's now interesting to us. And that's a really good sign. I think it is too. But how, how held back do you think our homeland is by this sort of standard narrative? Oh man, remember how cool it was when we were the only non-impoverished country like it's not our generation saying that really but it's sort of there's this expectation like why would you use the decades immediately after world war ii as like the idea of the normal state of things it seems it seems strange but the idea has a lot of traction and back at home yeah, and I think um, it's a very specific historical era. Uh, Thomas Piketty's work on 21st uh, capital in the 21st century. Uh, I mean, one of the things he really emphasizes one of the lowest periods of inequality in our nation's history. It was a time when all everyone did well. Um, the sort of rising tide rises all boats was very true during this period of time. And we're sort of seeing a reversion to a period much earlier in the U.S. history, the Gilded Age, the 1800s, um, where wealth was very dominant. And I think people look back a little bit with rose-colored glasses. I don't think I would want to live in the 60s. I don't think when you think about civil rights or gay rights or any... The state of the Internet in the 1960s. The internet, you know, I mean, the Internet existed. <laughs> it just only had eight places to go. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we have come in an enormous way. I think people forget that aspect of it. Um, but I, I think... When you look at the history of, say, Britain in the early 1900s, when it went from being the absolute superpower of the world um, that had you know, its hands in every single country and every continent to where it was 20 years following the Great War, I think psychologically it's really hard. Uh, people do consider things relatively. We are, you think of it as keeping up with the Joneses, but it's, it's hard, I think, for most people to have that notion that, hey, if my neighbor's getting better, this is beneficial to me, even though we're sort of competing for the same jobs or in the same industry, etc. Um, you know, people want to win and feel like they're way ahead. And, um, you know, to a certain extent, it's, it's a mindset change, and we have to sort of accept that. Um, not that, again, U.S. power is not absolutely declining. I mean, we're, we, our economy's grown. It's grown more than from 2007. It's bigger today than it was before. Our manufacturing industry is bigger today than 20 years ago. It just doesn't employ as many people. That's a huge issue. But it is bigger. We're selling more. We're exporting more. It's never been better for the United States. It's more so, people. Korea's uh, the population is starting right. to go down. Population is increasing. A lot of uh, the issues that you know Japan, Korea, Singapore face with declining birth rates, um, we don't face. And so, you know, I, I, it, there's silver linings. But again, it just it's hard when you're hundred x better. You know, it's like if you're playing, let's say, a sports game or you know, a whatever. Pick a skill where you're beating people a hundred to one. Now you're beating them five to one or two to one. You just don't feel like you're winning as much anymore. What's wrong with the world? You ask. <laughs> you know, things feel more competitive, and so, in my mind, I think we have to to accept that it's it's a good thing. I mean, if, if the rest of the world is developed. Uh, you know, there's a lot of evidence that development comes with liberty, comes with freedoms, comes with stability, comes with, um, you know, democracy. And so as people develop, as people get uh, richer, as people have wealth, you know, we're looking at a more prosperous, peaceful world, in my view. And so I, I remain optimistic and I hope that more people um, sort of pick up on that perspective as well. On a more specific experiential level, you know, how do you compare, say, Seoul to San Francisco, just the experiences you have in each. It's, they're cities that really don't seem similar in any respect at all when you compare them, but they're both cities, they're both important cities. I would say San Francisco is getting more important, or, you know, if I look at Seoul, I say this is a city with, that has realized a lot of potential. San Francisco, a city that could realize a lot of potential. What do you think about that? I think, um... I mean, San Francisco is an incredibly small city. Uh, I mean, San Jose is a larger city and the 10th largest city in the U.S., I believe, and uh, significantly larger than San Francisco. So ironically, San Francisco gets all the attention, and yet it's, it's almost half the size uh, of San Jose. And so I think what's interesting is when you look at the Bay Area as a region against Seoul, which I think gives it a little more, about 8 million people in both cases, about the same landmass, um, then it gets really interesting. I think... 
the biggest challenge facing the Bay Area is infrastructure. I think everyone understands this. It's housing, it's transportation, it's subways, it's high-speed rail. Uh, buildings above four stories. Believe it or not, it's even, exactly, and believe it or not, it's even internet. I mean, Silicon Valley in many places has some of the slowest internet in urban areas in the United States because uh, these, so the entirety of the Bay Area has nine counties, a hundred cities, and hundreds of additional Bay Conservation Corps, land management agencies, utilities districts. It is a smorgasbord, and chaos. it's pretty much chaos. And so, I mean, coming from Minneapolis, uh, where we have a metropolitan council, which represents the nine county sort of metro area that has land use control, that can designate places for transportation buildup and utilities, that can tell people you're moving the house, you're building more because this is good for the region, even though you as a city may not like this. You go to San Francisco and... You know, San Francisco holds San Francisco back, and that's always been the challenge. I think Seoul, I mean, I think the biggest difference for me, I mean, obviously, there's, they're totally different cities, but I think the mindset difference, which is so important, is Seoul does protect some elements of its historical culture. It has some beautiful areas, but it has a very pragmatic urban development philosophy. Um, in this very re this neighborhood we're in right now, um, this... Uh, main road here used to have a bunch of cars. It had very small sidewalks. It was fairly unsafe in terms of walking as a pedestrian. Just eight months ago, the government blocked cars from being on the main thoroughfare through here. It's a bus-only road now. It's one lane instead of two. The sidewalks were doubled in size. It's sort of a classic uh, urban development, um, sort of multi-use development, sort of uh, zoning pr uh, approach that um, you know San Francisco likes to idealize. But Los Angeles talks. Talks about it, and but it takes it takes time. It takes it, it takes so, ten years for it every time. You know, again, and then up the street, you know, we we remove the elevated highway that used to be here um, in just a couple of weeks, and you see where, you know, it, it is very practical. The streets move very quickly. Uh, the main road here has five lanes of traffic both directions. The middle lane is a dedicated bus lane. Um, there's dedicated turn lanes, so it's a massive street. But I, I think that that's what always makes Seoul so, work so well as a city, is that it's able to much more pragmatically handle all these different issues. And it, it just doesn't have as much of that almost religious zealot sort of approach that yeah. you talk to a planning commission meeting over in San Francisco and you have people talking about conspiracy. I, I went to one about um, putting in a subway along Gary Street, which is the most frequented bus system bus line in all of the western Mississippi. And there are people talking about conspiracies that the government has a secret research lab under the ground and like screaming in the meeting. And but and then the, the planning commission has to take that into account and, and organize and work with this. And so I just think that Seoul can work so much faster and that's just part of the, the process here. I, I always wonder if San Francisco or even Los Angeles, which looks like a model of flexibility compared to San Francisco, can learn from a place like Seoul. I mean it's sad. San Francisco, I feel like they they piss away their future for the sake of like four Victorian houses. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> yeah. why? Why? What's? It? It's, um, I mean, the, the the one challenging aspect here is is San Francisco's number one industry is tourism, yes. and so as a city, uh, tourism is a really great industry because it employs a lot of people, a lot of very good and a good range and diverse set of service jobs. And so from everyone from housekeepers and hotels up to managers, the tourist sites, etc. So you have a lot of middle to lower middle class jobs that are very important to keeping the city work well. Um, that's the challenge though, is how do you protect the tourist aspects of the city while also growing on behalf of the demand that that comes into that city. I mean, I think New York even faces this challenge today, that it's getting more and more sclerotic, that there are more and more rules. And I think, I think it's unfortunate because if you look at, New York's actually a great example of this. Every 30, 40 years, the city was reinvented. Um, we we reinvented regularly bottomed out. And you brought stuff down, you brought new stuff up, and you know part of being in a city is it's changing. It's not about it's making, almost a working definition of what a city is. Is something always changing? That's right. And you know we see this in Paris, you see this in London, you see this in New York and San Francisco. It's we've now prioritized 
protection of the old rather than adapting that city for change for the future. And I think... Yeah, a good sign of a culture that's gone on the defensive, which is not a good sign in of itself. Why isn't the future good? I mean, how do we know that, yes, the city's lifestyle is one way today, but how do we know the next 20 years may not actually be far better than it used to be? I mean, New York got to where it is today because of this, so... That's the main problem Korea doesn't have, is it... it it almost is too confident the future is good, it's, 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 but it's confident enough. That's right. And, you know, a lot of sort of classical parts of the city, I mean, you'll see this in uh, sort of the downtown areas where a temple will be right next to a high rise. And you know that if this was in San Francisco, there'd be at least a like, one mile radius around this that wasn't allowed to do that. Um, but that's one of the reasons why Seoul has now become a global city in less than 20, 25 years. And I think it, it just depends on what your values and what your goals and object, you know, objectives are. Uh, Seoul wants to be a global top 10 city. And it's not going to allow um, preservation of the entire city's built environment permanently to do this. A lot of the buildings are total crap. In fact, one of the things I always joke about is in San Francisco, people fight eminent domain. Here, you have families waiting for eminent domain so that they can cash out their house. building's 30 years old. Please tear it down. Please, you know, and literally they do these new town developments and they'll wipe out a neighborhood. And most people are very, not everyone, but a lot of people are so happy at the windfall profit from this that they really want this development. They advocate it. Like they fight to where the next set of money is going to come to. So it's just a different attitude. And I, I think that that's one of the strengths here is, you know, even though that's there, it's still, they protect parts of it. It's, it's certainly getting more livable. There are a lot more initiatives around this. The bus system is a lot better today. Um, and so, you know, one of the again, one of the challenges that San Francisco faces, its buses can't adapt. It's all electrified. It's so it, actually wrong. Has wire. it actually has wires. Yes. It's wired certain streets and certain routes. And so to change this requires rewiring the city to handle those bus routes. So you haven't created a system that allows for adaptation to people again. And I think... That's what's so important to a city, is being able to adapt how people want to live. Where else in Asia, from this vantage point, do you keep your eye on? What else? Where? What other cities are really interesting in this neck of the globe? You know, so I've spent a number of times, I've gone to Singapore a number of times, because I think Singapore benefits from being a real hub um, in Southeast Asia, um, or at least likes to advertise itself as such. So I do spend a lot of time thinking and keeping track of what's going on in, in Singapore. Um, outside of those two, those are the two focus areas I spend the most time on when I think of innovation hubs, the next generation of mobile, etc. cetera. Um, I don't think about Tokyo. I don't think about Taiwan too much. I don't think about China too much, which is its own market and doesn't go out very much. Um, I think a little bit about th uh, Thailand. There's a little bit of a nascent ecosystem there. There's actually more people. I'm always surprised at how large it is. Um, and th Thailand has quite a bit of political troubles in the last like 10 years and sort of throughout its history um, that it hasn't been able to organize as effectively as, say, Korea in really moving the needle on economic growth. But um, I guess it, uh, the next stage down would definitely be there, that that has a real potential. Um, you know, I also don't think much about Vietnam. Um, you know, every person I talk to who's worked in Vietnam has said never to work in Vietnam. Um, and so, you know, I just... I just tell the same story. I have not been there. I just listen to the entrepreneurs who have and have tried to do stuff, and they're like, I will never go back. I never want anything to do there. Um, I think a little bit about Australia, um, and that's about it. The entrepreneurs you talk to who work here in Korea, they tend to have positive experiences, good stories. They don't say, I'll never be back to Korea. You know, it's... <laughs> Everyone has different experiences here as a foreigner. I think the people who are most successful here do their part to learn the language, um, to understand that many of the rules are different, and by rules I mean social norms, um, the way things are done, and who realize and have sort of a flexible mindset around how business can be conducted, as we talked about. The government is much more involved in a lot of decision making. Um, the laws are not absolute. And the laws are not absolute. Many of them are great. Um, and I always say that 
depending on your persuasion, that's actually a good or a bad thing. Um, the benefit of this is Korea doesn't necessarily know the answer, and rather than legislating an answer, they sort of leave it ambiguous, and it sort of gets filled in over time. They're, they're going to wing a lot of this. They're going to wing it. And that, that's, again, I, I've said the government here is very dynamic. It, it, one area that I've really been paying attention to is venture capital laws. And the rules have changed so much over the last two, three years to allow venture capital to change, to adapt to what the industry needs, that, you know, it's not the government that really holds it back necessarily. Um, more work to be done, but it will get done. And that's something that you can't necessarily say in the U.S. where if you have an issue like immigration, here you can get that done in a few years or maybe even like six to 12 months um, with like Songdo or whatnot. That just comes automatically. Let's just get visas here. Smart people bring them in. In the U.S., we've been negotiating this for almost 15 years and we still don't have high tech visas. We still don't have the ability... can't turn that ship. We can't is a very unfortunate and, metaphor. Exactly. And you can't even get PhDs who went to our universities for five, six years who want to do jobs in the U.S. to build companies to be able to stay. We could come out of the country. We pay for them to come here to be educated and then kick them out. Yes. And so it's a strange... I mean, it's just... This is something that never happens here. That part so rarely happens where something so strategically wrong continues for a very long time. These things do change, and that, I think, is is the real strength here. Um, so when I think of foreign entrepreneurs, I think, um, you know, I, I think their frustrations come more from being in a nascent ecosystem that hasn't had a lot of entrepreneurship to begin with, rather than something particular or peculiar about the Korean experience. And finally, despite the role of the universities in innovation in the states historically. I feel like a lot of entrepreneurial culture really, really went uh, into overdrive when entrepreneurs realized they didn't need to hang out in school that long uh, in America. And you've been critical of sort of the school-related attitudes that have slowed certain things in the States. Do you think Korea can kick its school addiction? You know, so they call it education fever here. Uh, this idea that you always need to get another degree now today there are a lot of these work certificates there are like thousands of these degrees where you can learn like specific types of programming languages or specific skill sets so you can get a certificate um, there's a real credentialing and title culture um, that is very tough to get past I think school is really important to innovation I think we've gone through a sort of 10 year period of time in which you could just have an idea, an app it's sort of a, a bad joke, but it's like an idea, an app store, and an app, and sort of all this work together, you could build something really great. And that was because of an unbelievable amount of leverage you had. You can reach hundreds of millions of people on day one of launch. Um, no matter what you went, if, if you went to school, it doesn't matter. That's right, and no one knows who the people who designed these apps. No one cares. Exactly. I think as the industry matures, the opportunities become more complex. They become tougher. They become harder problems where... People who do have more experience, whether that's traditional education, whether it's self-taught, doesn't matter, but where you can't just wing it and build an app on a weekend and try to build it up. I think I think the bar is actually getting quite high. And if you look at some of the companies that are coming out today, you know, it's interesting that there are very, very few dropouts who run these these companies, um, even the computer industry. Whereas that's like a meme in the U.S. Of course you're a dropout. Bill Gates was a dropout. You know, if you want to talk about myths, I mean, I, I have a couple of myths. I mean, one of which is definitely the dropout myth, which is entrepreneurs all drop out. Actually, on average, they're far more educated than the rest of the population. In fact, many of them have graduate degrees, particularly in computer science or business. So master's in computer science, doctoral degrees, or at least were in PhDs when they dropped out. Um, it's a really good sign because the kind of obsession around an idea is highly correlated with people who are obsessed in research in, in a PhD program. You know, it's a very similar kind of group. Um, obsessed with something. Obsessed with something. Um, the notion that Stanford students are more entrepreneurial than other students is also a myth. Um, very few people at Stanford drop out. The graduation rate for a five-year graduation rate is something like 98%. Um, most people aren't dropping out for startups. Most people will not graduate to go to a startup. Most of them go to Google or Facebook or other large, stable companies. And so I think there are a lot of misnomers about, you know, Americans are far more entrepreneurial than Koreans. I don't see that at all. I think the challenge is, is that the infrastructure is different. And so what I've always argued is doing a startup in the United States, particularly Silicon Valley, is a relatively safe career choice. Um, 
you can get a, a talent acquisition. It always looks good on a resume. You will get hired at a large company afterwards, even if you don't get acquired. Um, you're going to learn skill sets faster. And there's so much venture capital funding coming along that getting 100K, paying your bills, is not that hard if you just get started. The same is not the case here. Um, in many cases, you take on personal liability to start a business here. So if your business fails, you are personally held liable for every dollar that you got as an investment. And so I always say the entrepreneurship rate, any difference there comes from these sorts of policies. If these, if those were the policies in the U.S., we would see no you know, innovation or entrepreneurship there either. And so I would much rather see people talk about laws and rules and regulations more than culture. I don't see a culture difference. I see an amazing entrepreneurial culture here, particularly in Seoul. Laboring under a legal difference. Uh, laboring under tougher rules than they have to face in the United States. And so, um, can we get past education fever? You know, that'll come when there are alternatives to choose from in the labor force. Today, the best way to get a top job is to have a lot of credentials from a top school, top certificates, etc. When startups are a viable option, I guarantee you people will choose to do that. They need examples of that being, you know, when the first millionaire really comes out, who's 24, I assure you everyone will be a startup entrepreneur in the next year because that's what everyone will focus on. They'll so talk about that the way they talk about Harvard. <laughs> exactly. So They'll talk about dropping out of Harvard the way right. that they talk about That's Harvard. Right. Uh, and I always joke, like, you just have to connect it to success. And, um, and I think that's actually what drives entrepreneurs the most, is, is, is the goal of success, whether that's money or fame or power or whatnot, or building a great product. Every Suc culture knows success. Every culture knows success, and the, the focus on success here is really high. Um, and so when the rules for success change, that's, you'll see the change immediately in the way that students and parents interact and how they make decisions. I've been speaking here in Seoul, Korea with Danny Crichton. He's a writer and researcher on regional innovation hubs and a writer for TechCrunch. And he's based right now in Seoul, Korea, but I don't know. Who, know, who knows what the future holds, right? Any, any, other, any other plans to relocate? Are you Seoul for the foreseeable future? I will be moving to Boston in a few weeks. So that is a very foreseeable future. Why Boston in brief? Um, I am heading to graduate school, so continuing doing the research. On education fever. <laughs> exactly. Danny, thanks so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Colin. This has been Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org. Thanks. And special thanks to all the backers of Notebook on Cities and Culture's Korea tour on Kickstarter. Adam Hartzell, Aidan Nullman, Alfred Lee, Andy Cooney, Angus Gordon, Bala Chinupati, Cam Smith, Chin Music Press, Dan Caracelli, Danny, Deborah Smith, Emmett Farragher, Humberto Grant, Ian Plosker, Ismail Kennessy, Jackie Gast, Jay Chang, Jeffrey Davis, James DeVito, Jonathan Filbert, Josh Paget, Kimberly Hahn, Manvir, Mark Hines, Matthew, Matthew Workman, Boreen Kincaid Speller, Monica Eck, Michael Fransky, MJ Pritchett, Patrick O'Flaherty, Patrick Park, Piers Rippey, Robert Salzberg, Samuel Hansen, Sean Brown, Emistoc Mr. Thomas Unterberger, Timothy Dobbs, and Wayne Wright. 